In our last study this morning, we saw one of the greatest defences of the faith ever given. It was calm, it was dignified, and yet it was unanswerable, it was irrefutable. The Sanhedrin had no answer except to revert to base animal nature and to resort to savage brutality. You see, the death of Stephen in this chapter is going to show the progression in thought amongst the Jewish authorities. Frustrated by the fact that killing Jesus did not bring his effect upon the people to an end, anxious about the increasing numbers of converts to the faith, and particularly so after the great company of priests become obedient to the faith back in chapter 6, and infuriated at the feeling of their own helpless impotence, they take increasingly drastic measures to put a halt to the disciples' preaching. Come with, back me a few, come back with me a few pages back to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and verse 18. They called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of all the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. And so the antagonism begins with intimidations and threats, but it stops there because of the fear of the people. Chapter 5, over a page in verse 18, they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. They were filled with indignation, verse 17. Yeah. And so they, they stick the apostles in prison. And so the next phase is to imprison these, these people. Verse 40 of the same chapter. To him they agreed, that is to Gamaliel they agreed, when they called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And so beating is going to now follow and further intimidations. Until finally, in this chapter, we now reach the death of the first individual for their faith. Murder is going to be within the hearts of the Jewish leaders. Christ's words of condemnation in Matthew 23 are particularly apt here. Ye are the children of them that killed that, that kill the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. And this is exactly what they're going to do in this instant now with the death of Stephen. In verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. And so verse 54 is going to give the Sanhedrin's response to when they heard these things. Now, this had been the spirit of the nation all along, whether to the law or to the prophets or to Christ or to Stephen, their response had always been the same. The accusation that Stephen laid against them, verse 51, you are, are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, Stephen says. And early in the chapter, in the law, in relation to Moses, in their hearts, they turned back again into Egypt. When, when, when Moses comes with the law, him shall you hear, they, they would hear, but to whom they did not obey. The prophets, Zechariah 7, but they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder, we're told. That is, they turned away. They stopped their ears. They clapped their hands over their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, we're told. They deliberately switched off any moral compulsions, any feeling of tenderness or feeling of understanding the truth. Lest, we're told, lest they should hear the law and the words which Yahweh of hosts hath sent in his spirit by the for former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from Yahweh of hosts. And Christ said this in Matthew 13, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And so now in the case of Stephen, they're going to be cut to the heart, and they're going to stop their ears. This had always been the spirit of the nation. Verse 54 tells us they were cut to the heart. And the word cut means to divide, divide by a saw, to be sawn through mentally. And the only other occurrence of this phrase is actually a couple of chapters back, back in Acts and chapter 5. Come with me there. Verse 29, Peter says this, 
Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we, we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. And when, verse 33, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart. And what do they do? They took counsel to slay them. And only a little, a little while earlier, shortly earlier, Peter and the other apostles had stood up in the middle of the Sanhedrin, just like Stephen has, and he calls them to account for their role in killing their Messiah. And they, they, they're cut in the heart. They take counsel to slay them. And it's only Gamaliel's words that follow that prompts second thoughts. So now what prompts this second instance of the Sanhedrin being cut to the heart? Well, it's exactly the same thing. It's Stephen's ringing denunciation of their betrayal and murdering of the just one. But now also it is their constant disobedience to the law, verse 53, just like their fathers. And so Stephen's words are going to grate on them. They're going to grind on them like a saw being pulled this way and that way, back and forth upon their hard hearts. It's interesting, interesting to compare the two responses to the gospel message. If you come back a few more pages back to Acts chapter 2, because in Acts 2, Peter's message to the people had contained a similar message of how the people had crucified Jesus, whom God hath raised up from the dead, elevated him to his right hand and proclaimed him, to be both Lord and Christ. And the people's response in Acts 2 and verse 37 is one of humility and repentance. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. The word means to pierce, to pain the mind sharply, to agitate it vehemently. And they're pricked in their heart and they say unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, you'll recall Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the sword of the spirit, as Ephesians 6 verse 17 tells us, and remember that Stephen is going to be full of the Holy Spirit, verse 55, the sword of the Spirit has the capacity to expose sin for what it really is. And it results in one of two responses. Firstly, as we read in Acts chapter 2, it pricked them in their heart. That is, it can pierce our heart with its point. It can invoke a sense of ownership, a sense of accountability, a sense of repentance. Or, conversely, as Acts 5 and Acts 7 says, they were cut to the heart. It can divide our heart in two with its edge. It can invoke a sense of denial, a sense of rejection, conscience-searing. And isn't this how the sword of the Spirit works in our lives also? We can hear the Spirit word expanded to us. We can do our daily Bible readings. We can come along on Sunday and hear the word of exhortation. We can feel our consciences being struck. We can realize that we need to change our ways. And at that point in time, we can either acknowledge our sins and repent and change, or we can feel the pang of guilt and then deny the need for change and go our way. What choice do we make in these situations? What response reigns supreme in our hearts? Is it the thinking of the spirit or the thinking of the flesh? How have we trained ourselves to think? Allowing the sword of the spirit to work in our lives is a, is a pretty painful experience at times. No one likes having to acknowledge sin. But surrendering ourselves to its sharpness is ultimately a far more peaceful experience than trying to avoid it altogether. And so now Stephen is going to be given 
a vision of Christ in heaven, verse 55 to 56. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So why was he given this vision of Christ? Well, I believe there's perhaps four key reasons. Firstly, to verify Stephen's words as truth. Just remember what the accusations against him actually were. Chapter 6, verse 13. Blasphemy against this holy place and blasphemy against the law. So now Stephen is going to be given a vision of heaven, Christ's, or God's true dwelling place, this holy place. He's going to be given a vision of heaven, God's true dwelling place. Bless me against the law. He's going to be given a vision of Jesus, the true fulfillment of the law. This is going to verify Stephen's words as truth. It's also going to remind Stephen of his hope. Verse 55, he, he looked up steadfastly into heaven. Just imagine the scene. Even amidst all the hostility and violent mutterings from the Sanhedrin, Stephen keeps directing his attention and his gaze into heaven. Chapter 6, verse 15. Remember, the Sanhedrin are looking steadfastly on him. But he isn't looking at them. His gaze is fixed on Christ in heaven. He has the same earnest devotion to pleasing the Father, to fixing his mind on the future hope just as Christ did, who steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And was there ever, was there ever a man who so perfectly demonstrated the spirit of those beautiful words of Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 4, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And he's going to see the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, where his hope was. And so Stephen's going to be reminded of his hope even in these last minutes of his life. The third reason is to remind Stephen that his Lord could see what was happening, that he would bring righteous judgment. Because you see in verse 55, we're told that Jesus, that Stephen rather, sees Jesus standing but in verse 56, he doesn't say that to the Sanhedrin. He doesn't say, behold, I see the heavens opened and Jesus standing. He says, behold, I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Why does he do this? Well, the, this is the only other time in the New Testament where the phrase, the Son of Man is used other than Jesus himself. This is the only time in the New Testament that the Son of Man is used other than Jesus himself. John chapter 5, verse 27 to 29, the Son of Man, the title of Christ is judge, it appears, because we're told, so hath the Father given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. The hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall come forth, some to the resurrection of life, some to the resurrection of condemnation. Or Matthew chapter 25, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them. And so the title of the Son of Man is a title of Christ acting as judge. And this is also why he sees Jesus standing at God's right hand. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 13 to 15, Yahweh standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. Yahweh will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. Psalm 109 verse 31, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those that condemn his soul. 
And the very next verse, Psalm 110, verse 1. Sit there at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And so Stephen is going to see Jesus in his role as a righteous judge, standing up in readiness to tread upon his enemies in vengeance for the blood of not only himself, but also the other faithful servants of all ages, and to save the poor of this world rich in faith. Now, in one sense, this coming of judgment could apply to Christ coming as the leader of the Roman army to destroy Jerusalem in AD 70 and to save those who endured to the end. But I believe in a greater sense, this applies to Christ coming in his second advent. The next conscious moment that Stephen would have as the righteous judge of all the earth to break in pieces the oppressor and to save the children of the needy. We're going to see this a little more in our next point. Because the fourth point was to remind now the Sanhedrin of Christ's final words, Christ's final eerie words in his trial. Matthew chapter 26. Hold a hand in, in Acts chapter 7 and come back with me to Matthew 26. Matthew 26 and reading verse 63 to 64. Jesus held his peace. And the high priest adjured him and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says to him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And the high priest is going to rend his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you, are, you have heard his blasphemy. What think you? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. And so Stephen's vision here of the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God is not going to be a fulfillment of Christ's prophecy in Matthew chapter 26. It is not going to be the fulfillment of Christ's words. It is a reaffirmation. There are a few important differences between the two visions. You see, in Acts chapter 7, it doesn't say that his hearers could likewise see his vision. This was a vision given peculiarly to Stephen himself. It was only, it appears, when Stephen told them of it that their anger and their fury, fury was provoked. Whereas in Matthew 26, the siege, Sanhedrin were told, hereafter shall ye see. In Acts chapter 7, we're told Christ is going to be standing. In Matthew 26, Christ was going to be sitting. In Acts chapter 7, there's no reference of Christ coming in the clouds of heaven as there is in Matthew 26. So there are some differences between these two visions. Nevertheless, Stephen is telling them that just as Christ had told them that he would come in power to bring judgment upon them, now he could actually see Christ preparing to return and bring that judgment. And whereas Christ said that he would be sitting on the right hand of power, Stephen says that he was standing on the right hand of God. Judgment was even now closer than it was before. And the reason, the reason why there are no clouds in Stephen's vision is because the clouds that Christ spoke of were still in the process of being formed. What type of clouds are they? Clouds of witnesses. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And when they are formed, who else are they going to include amongst their number of witnesses than the first witness martyr to the faith, Stephen himself? He will stand with Christ in judgment at that day. And so as much as this was a vision to encourage Stephen, the fact that he shared it with the Sanhedrin shows us that this was not a vision to simply remain private just for Stephen. It was to remind the Sanhedrin that the final words of Christ in his trial still held true. They would face judgment one day and they would come face to face with the man that they had betrayed and murdered. Now, verse 57, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Just note how 
after Stephen condemns them in verse 51 to 53, their heart, we're told, verse 54, is smitten. But it's only after Stephen tells them that Jesus is at the right hand of God, standing in preparation for judgment upon them, just as Christ has said in Matthew 26, that they bellow with rage, they clap their hands over their ears, and they rush him out of the meeting chamber. There's some deep emotions, some deep emotions at play here. Rage. They're full of rage at Stephen's blasphemous words and outrageous accusation. But there's guilt as well, suppressed guilt. They know that they've sinned. They know they're about to sin as well, but they aren't prepared to admit it. They can't handle anyone exposing their sin. They haven't developed the mind that's willing to allow the sword of the Spirit to work in their lives. And there's suppressed fear as well. Because if Jesus really was the Messiah at God's right hand, well, the judgment, the judg the judgment that's going to come one day is going to be severe indeed. And so they're going to run upon him, verse 57, with one accord. Now, the phrase one accord is used in two main ways in Scripture. It's used within the faith. In the spirit of Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And throughout the book of Acts, we're going to find this lovely spirit of unity within the faith. There's going to be unity in prayer, Acts 1. Unity in worship, Acts 2. Unity in fellowship, Acts 2. Unity in praise, Acts 4. Unity in preaching, Acts 5. Unity in obedience, Acts 6. And unity in the decisions that are made, chapter 15. But there's also going to be one accord used in the opposite sense. Against the faith. In the spirit of Joshua chapter 9 verse 2, they gather themselves together, the kings of the Canaanites, to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And so in the book of Acts, we are also going to find there's going to be a spirit of unity. But this time, this is, this is not a spirit of unity within the faith, for the faith, but a spirit of unity against the faith. And it's going to manifest itself in violence here in Acts chapter 7. It's going to manifest itself in deceit, Acts chapter 12, in a riot and chaos, Acts chapter 18, and in anger, Acts chapter 19. You see, what we have here is, is one accord within the faith and against the, against the faith. One, the wisdom from above that's, that, 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 that's earthly, but the wisdom, uh, wisdom from above that's pure and peaceable and gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and one, the wisdom from below. Earthly, sensual, devilish, envy, strife, confusion, every evil work. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, there are only two groups in God's eyes. There are those that are in accord with him, and there are those that in, are in one accord against him. There's only two seeds, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent. Even those at odds with each other within the seed of the serpent can find it within themselves to make peace, if it means uniting together on a common basis against the other seed. For instance, Luke chapter 23, verse 12, the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together for before they were at enmity with, with each other or between themselves. And the same thing is going to happen here. Remember, we went to Acts chapter 23, but remember the Sanhedrin is comprised of a variety of several different religious orders, Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, elders. In Acts 23, Paul is going to notably divide the Sanhedrin by introducing the subject of the resurrection in his address, which the Pharisees believed in, but which the Sadducees rejected. And the Sanhedrin are completely divided down the line. Chaos is going to ensue. But it says something about the enmity of this diverse bunch of Jews. That whereas they were divided in the case of Paul, even Paul, here, they're going to be united in their vehement opposition to Stephen. And in verse 58, they're going to cast him out of the city. They rejected him just like they and their forefathers had done to others, as we saw in our previous class. And they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now, why lay their clothes down? Why do that? 
And why lay their clothes down at, at a young man's feet? Well, the clothes, the Greek tells us, is referencing the upper garment. It's the cloak or the mantle or like a jacket. And if I was to try and stone someone, I'd probably take off my jacket to do so. So they're going to lay aside every weight. As Hebrews 11 or 12 verse 1 tells us, they're going to lay aside every weight so that their throne motion would not be impeded. They really wanted their stones to find the mark. Now, under the law, the fate of the blasphemer was death by stoning. And Leviticus 24 tells us this, verse 16, He that blasphemeth the name of Yahweh, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him. But who were the witnesses that we read about here in chapter 7, verse 58? Well, come back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17, I'm going to read verse 2 through to verse 7, because this is going to tell us some information about the witnesses. Deuteronomy 17, verse 2. If there be found among you within any of thy gates, which Yahweh thy God giveth thee, man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of Yahweh thy God in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven which I have not commanded, and it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true in the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel, then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shalt stone them with stones till they, do, till they die. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. And so thou shalt put away, or put the evil away from among you. And so Deuteronomy chapter 17 is going to give us a lot of information. It's going to give us information about the crime. This is, this is a crime where man and woman has wrought wickedness, or they've transgressed his covenant, or they've gone and served other gods and worshipped them. And what's the next phase? Well, the next phase is to have diligent examination to verify whether the sin has truly taken place. And so there's a, there's a five-step uh, stage. If it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold it be true, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel. There's a process to go through, to, to a diligent process to verify that the sin has truly taken place. And the punishment is going to be given for us in verse 5. Bring forth that man or woman unto thy gates and stone them with stones till they die. And in verse 6 and 7, we're going to see the role of the witnesses. Firstly, that there were to be at least two or three witnesses required to give consistent evidence as to the sinner's guilt. One was not going to be enough. It needed at least two or three. And secondly, it was the responsibility of the witnesses to cast the first stones. And as soon as they'd cast those stones, then everyone else joined in. But just see, just see the hypocrisy and the wickedness of the Sanhedrin here in the case of Stephen. Because you may recall that in Acts chapter 7, verse 41 to 43, it was they and their fathers who were guilty of going and serving other gods and worshipping them. They had done this sin, the same sin that they're now going to stone Stephen for. They had done this sin. And moreover... <laughs> There's no diligent examination that takes place here to verify the truth of Stephen's sin. There's no cross-examination. There's no independent witnesses that agreed with each other's testimony. There's no time to sit, to deliberate to, to, as to whether he's guilty or not. The Sanhedrin have forgotten the same law they accuse Stephen of speaking blasphemous words against because they're going to completely ignore the process of Deuteronomy chapter 17. And they stoned Stephen, verse 59. Now, the Mishnah, which is a part of the Jewish Talmud, was compiled in around about AD 200. But it has this to say 
on the topic of stoning. That when he come, when he came to four L's or four cubits from the place of execution, he was to be stripped of his garments. If a male, he was covered in front. If a female, she was covered on both sides. The stoning place was two heights of a man. One of the witnesses pushed him on his thighs that he should fall with the back to the surface. But if he fell face down, he had to be turned over. If he died from the effects of the first fall, nothing more was to be done. If not, the second witness took a stone and thrust it against his heart. If he died, nothing more was to be done. But if not, all who were standing by had to throw stones on him. Thus, as Deuteronomy 17 says, the hand of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death and the hand of all the people at the last. And finally, all who are stoned are also hanged. The sages, however, said only a blasphemer and an idolater are hanged, but no others. And as these regulations for stoning were given much later on in Israel's, Israel's history in AD 200, it's possible that some of these instructions were not followed to the letter of what the Mishnah will go on to say roughly 170 years later. But if they were, if they were consistent with the days of Stephen, well, then because the charges laid against Stephen were, were for blasphemy, then after the brutality of being stoned to death, Stephen may then also have suffered the indignity of being hanged. And perhaps in this also, he followed the example of the Lord Jesus, who likewise was taken and hanged on a tree. And we're told, verse 58 and verse 59, twice we're told that they stoned him. And moreover, the word is used in an imperfect tense, which carries the idea that this is a continuous and a repetitive act. It wasn't the initial, the initial fall that killed Stephen. It wasn't the first stone thrust against his heart, nor was it even the initial barrage of stones. It was a protracted, drawn-out pelting that probably continued long, long after his life had come to an end. Such was the fury and the anger and the rage of those who sought his death. We have painted for us a vivid picture of the suffering that he endured, we see as well the strength of a mind that is willing, even with all these rocks flying at him, smashing into his exposed flesh. We see his attempt to struggle to his knees into the posture of prayer and to pray that his persecutors might one day find forgiveness for their sins. Just picture him, verse 55. He's still steadfastly looking into heaven as he calls upon God and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. In verse 60, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He cries with a loud voice. The same phrase as what they had done in verse 57. They cried out with a loud voice. Exactly the same phrase, but whereas theirs was in rage, his was in forgiveness. And he repeats Christ's words from Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, he says. But he omits Christ's further words, for they knew not what they, they know not what they do. Because these men, you see, these men knew exactly what they were doing. It was an act of deliberate evil, motivated by a hardened heart and furious anger. You know, the principle here is that true men and women of God wouldn't want guilty people to escape the consequences of their sins because we know that that would be inconsistent with God's righteous character. However, we wouldn't want to feel that people are going to be lost to God's kingdom because of us. And so Stephen's words, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge, show his remarkable spirit and his attitude that we read about in Acts chapter 6. Here is a man who could deliver both a calm and measured and balanced speech and yet then a stinging denunciation of their ways at the end of it. And yet underneath it all, 
Underneath it all, his primary motivation is that his words might affect their hearts, that they might repent, that they might be saved. What an amazing spirit to have in our own teaching and preaching to others, that regardless of whether we speak in a still small voice or in words of fire and earthquake and wind, our underlying spirit is not to vindicate ourselves and it's not to judge others, but it's to have a single-minded desire to save other people. This is the spirit of Stephen. In verse 60, when he had said this, he fell asleep. A beautiful expression for so violent a death. This is the expression used for the saints when they die. You see, it's the case of David, as Acts 13 verse 36 says, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers. It's the words concerning Lazarus in John chapter 11. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. It's the words concerning the saints at the crucifixion and the, uh, the crucifixion of Christ that in Matthew 27, many bodies of the saints which slept arose. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Or 1 Thessalonians 4, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Because when you have, when you have the hope of the resurrection, although death is complete and there is no knowledge in the grave, it is still ultimately only a temporary state. And one day, the saints will be taken out of their state of peaceful repose and have God's spirit breathed into them once more. And it will seem as though they simply wake from a peaceful slumber. And in chapter 8, verse 2, we're told that devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. You see, the death of this great man, this giant of the faith, the first martyr, in the name of Jesus Christ, he inspires all the love and the grief of those who share his hope and his spirit. And mournfully, with great tears and with great lamentation, and probably at great personal risk too, they tenderly collect the battered, bloody, and bruised corpse. They gently wash away the filth and the dried blood. They bind it in grave clothes they anoint it with spices and they bury it in a quiet place. And there he lies still. Now surely molded into dust, awaiting the hope of the resurrection of the dead and the glorification that will surely follow. The final steps in his spiritual journey following in the footsteps of his Lord and Redeemer, the first fruits of them that sleep. Now Stephen or Stephanos, as you may, may remember from our first study, means crowned. And this man is going to be crowned in the same way as the Lord. First Peter 5 verse 4, When the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. First Peter 5 verse 4. Now, as we read this story, the story of Stephen, you may have seen it, but it's impossible, it's impossible not to see that Stephen is a magnificent type of Christ. He is a true follower of Christ in so many ways. And let's have a look at some of those ways. He has the same qualities. They were both men full of the Spirit, full of wisdom, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. Christ was strong in spirit and in wisdom. They did the same miracles. They did great wonders and miracles. But there's a conflict. There's a conflict with the religious elders, with the Pharisees. There's certain of the synagogue that dispute with him. The Pharisees question him. But their words are going to be unanswerable. The people are going to be unable to resist his wisdom and his spirit. No man is able to answer him, we're told. Never man spake like this man. The people are going to be stirred up. They're going to be moved to anger, to violence. The Sanhedrin are going to be involved, all of them. There's going to be a trial here. And this man's going to be seized by force. They're going to come upon him and, and lay hands upon him and take him. And they're going to be, he's going to be brought before the council. There's going to be false witnesses brought to bear. And what's the charge going to be? He speaks blasphemous words. He hath spoken blasphemy, we're told. 
And specifically, charge number one, we're told, blasphemy against the temple. This fellow said, he said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God. Blasphemy. Charge number two, blasphemy against the law. Why do you that which is not lawful? And there's going to be like an angel, a face shining like the sun. There's going to be an illegal trial involved with aspects of the trial and prosecution that that are illegal. There's going to be no judicial sentence or verdict, no cross-examination. There's going to be illegality regarding the arrest, the time of trial, the cross-questioning, the lack of witnesses. And the adversary is going to have an attitude that is uncircumcised in heart and ears, heart wax gross, ears full of dull, of dull of hearing. There's going to be a hostile adversary. They're going to gnash on him with their teeth. But there's going to be nevertheless a steadfast focus, a looking steadfastly up into heaven. The time was come when he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face and he's going to receive and give a vision of the heavenly glory. He's going to see the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand. And the final straw to it all, the promise of impending judgment. I see the heavens opened, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, coming in the clouds of, of heaven. The opposition is going to be united in enmity. They're going to run upon him with one accord. The same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together before they were at enmity with this, with, uh, with, with, between themselves. He's going to be cast out of the city. And Jesus also is going to suffer without the gate. The spirit is going to be surrendered to God. Receive my spirit. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. There's going to be a loud cry and a call for forgiveness. Lay not the sin to their charge. Forgive them. They know not what they do. And he's going to be hung upon a tree, buried by righteous men. Great weeping and mourning, great lamentation, a great company of people bewailing, lamenting, weeping. You see, they're going to be crowned with a crown of suffering. And yet they will also be crowned with a crown of glory and honor. story of Stephen is going to be the story of Christ. It parallels almost exactly the work of Christ. The first significant blow by the seed of the serpent against the seed of the woman after the death of Christ has now in this chapter been struck. But it will not be the last because lurking, lurking in the background even at the beginning of the story and now finally revealed and named at the, at the end of the story, there is a young, zealous man from Tarsus called Saul, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the ecclesia, touching the righteousness which is, which is in the law, blameless. And it is this man who is going to be Stephen's chief antagonist. He's right there from the beginning as one from the synagogue of Cilicia in chapter 6. He's going to be there arguing, disputing, debating. It was going to be through this man's zeal that Stephen was going to be hauled in front of the Sanhedrin and then rushed outside and disposed of. And yet the death of Stephen is not going to satiate the desire for judgment upon the enemies of God for this young man. Instead, it is only going to feed it because in Acts chapter 8, we read that at that time there was a great persecution against the ecclesia, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Samaria, Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the ecclesia and hailing men and women committed them to prison. However, despite this attitude, And behind the dogged determination, the fiery fury and the savage persecution lies a tortured mind, a mind that has been torn in two, that flips between extreme certainty and extreme doubt, a heart that has been both cut and pierced, a conscience that is pricking and been ignored with only partial success. You see the words of Stephen have had an effect on at least one member of the audience. And in God's good time, 
He will bring the full power of them crashing home in such a way that will leave no room for doubt, only remorse and repentance, as Stephen had hoped and prayed for. And that story and the effect, the wisdom and the spirit of Stephen had on the life of Saul of Tarsus, this will be our word of exhortation.